Okay, so this is your free response study guide for Unit 6 test. Um, I'll just go ahead and go through all the questions. Hopefully, though, I'd, I'd like you guys to definitely try to be doing this on your own before you watch this. This is just meant to help you out if you're getting stuck on something. So let's go ahead and begin here. The height of a tree at time t is given by the differentiable function h, where h of t is measured in meters and t is measured in years. Selected values of h of t are given in the table below. All right, so part A asks us to evaluate the integral of h prime of t from t equals 2 to 10. And then they want us to interpret what it means. All right, so first of all, let me make some workspace here for myself real quick. Okay, maybe I won't add space there. So let's go ahead and just begin here. So um, we want to integrate um, h prime of t from 2 to 10. So now when you want to integrate this, and remember, you guys, on these FRQs, how you show your work is kind of important. The integral of h prime is h. And we're going from 2 to 10, so we're going to do this. So for this one, it's just as easy as looking at the table. What is h of 10? It's 15. What is h of 2? 1.5. So my final answer is 13.5. Now they're asking for us to interpret what that means in the context of the problem. So whenever you do an interpretation, um, it has to include the input units, output units, and the context. Context means what is this story about, basically. So first of all, let's, let's start with units. What are my input units? My input units are the variable on the inside of the parentheses, so that's time. So my input units are years, right? What are my output units? In other words, what are the units of this thing right here, the final answer I got? What is the output units? Well, it's an, these are h values, aren't they? So according to our table, h is a matter of meters. So my output units is meters. And what's the context of this problem? Well, basically what we have is we have a, a tree with a height, correct? And over time, the height is increasing. So Here's what this represents. Now we're integrating um, this, h prime of t, from 2 to 10. Okay, So what this means is that the height of the tree, there's my output units and context, the height of the tree increased by 13.5 meters from, I'm running out of space, so I have to, I'll write it over here, from t equals 2 to t equals 10 years. So there's my interpretation, okay? The height of the tree increased. There's your context by 13.5 meters, there's my output units, from t equals 2 to t equals 10 years, there's my input units. So your interpretation should have all three of those elements within it. Okay. So on this test, um, this particular question, you would get one point for finding the correct answer and one point for having the correct sentence describing the interpretation. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Use a right Riemann sum to find this. Now, I've noticed that a lot of times on your guys' FRQs, you're, you're not showing your work for this, so you do need to show your work, okay? Also, um, notice the difference here. This is the integral of h of t. This was the integral of h prime of t, okay? So, we're doing the integral of h. In other words, we're adding together all the area under the curve of h in this case instead. Different, different question. 
So when you're doing a right Riemann sum, right, the first thing you want to do is you want to find all the bases of your rectangle. So this is 1, 2, 2, 3. And starting on the right side, my height is 15, 11, 6, and 1, and we don't include the last one. Now how should you show your work, though? They're not going to give you credit for this on your FRQ, okay? What they want to see is at least this. 3 times 1 plus 6 times 2 plus 11 times 2 plus 15 times 3. Okay? Um, and we're going to go ahead and simplify it. But honestly, in an FRQ, you could just stop there. That's the answer. However, I know that we're going to need it and uh, the problem's coming up, so I'm going to go ahead and simplify it. So we have 3 plus 12 plus 22 plus 45. I'll add that up really quick here. Oops. 3, 12, 22, 45. It's like 82. Okay? Now I'm not going to put any units on there. Um, they just wanted to find a, a Riemann sum. They did not ask for units. The units would be kind of weird, honestly, so I'm not even going to bother putting them there at this point. But for now, there's our answer, 82. Let's go ahead and move on to Part C. And then, now in Part C, they're asking, oh, by the way, for this problem, um, it could be uh, on, on these tests, they, they usually make it worth, um, I, I, would, I would personally think of it being a one-point question, but I have seen them make it a two-point. Um, one point for showing your work accurately and one point for getting the correct answer. Um, on our test, I think I'm just going to be giving you guys the point for getting the correct answer. However, if you don't show your work, then you will not get any points. I need, to, I need you guys to show your work, okay? And what you do on the table does not count as showing your work. Um, all right, part C. Is the estimate of part B an overestimate or underestimate and explain your answer? This is a one-point question. Uh, you do have to get your answer right, but you also have to include your explanation, and it's, it's all or nothing. So here we go. We have a right Riemann sum, and now the problem doesn't say this, but look at your y values. What do you notice about them? They are increasing. Now I should have put in here, technically, because it's possible that it did decrease in between, and we didn't see it, but I mean, does a, does a tree's height ever shrink? No. So. Uh, but technically, I should have put up here in the top that h is an increasing function. So, uh, on your test, I'll be more clear about it. So since h is increasing, and we are doing a right... Riemann sum, we can come to a conclusion of it being increasing or decreasing. Here it is. When a function's increasing and you're doing right sums, the rectangles are above, therefore it's an overestimate. Just be as specific as possible here. My answer, which was, I think it was 82, 82 is an overestimate. for the integral 2 to 10 h of t dt. Uh, this stuff here is getting a little bit fancy um, where you get into you know putting the specific numbers in there. It may not be necessary. Um, my only concern is, is saying it's an overestimate uh, might be a little too vague. Um, you, to be more specific, you know, you, you could write it like this, saying that 82 is an overestimate of the integral, or you could just say our answer in part B is an overestimate. That would be more specific as well. I just would stay away from the word it's, otherwise we're not being very specific. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at part D. Now in part D, they're asking us to do the same thing again, using our answer from part B to find this, and then they want us to interpret what it means, okay? Well, we already found this, right? It's 82. So 1 over 8 integral 2 to 10 h of t. 
is going to be 1 over 8 times 82, right? But now they, they're asking us to interpret what it means. And so the question is, what's up with this 1 eighth? What does that even mean? Well, um, this is kind of a tricky question, but I've seen these asked a few times. Notice we're going from 2 to 10. Is there a relationship between the numbers 2, 10, and 8? There sure is. 8 is 1 over 10 minus 2. And so what they're doing here, you guys, is this is a sneaky way of getting you to notice that this is an average value. That's the average value theorem. So if I go ahead and write this 82 over 8, we don't need to reduce it. We can say 82 over 8 is the average height of the tree. But you have to say in the context, is the average height of the tree from t equals 2 to t equals 10. And this, this is important. You guys do need to specify it's the average height on what interval. Because, you know, if I did given you guys a different interval, we would have a different answer. So make sure that when you guys do your answer, you have the answer, the fact that it's an average, and specify the interval it's applying to. So this is the average height of the tree between years 2 and 10. Okay. All right. Next one says, estimate h prime of 4 and interpret what it means in the context of the problem. So this is an instantaneous rate of change, but you can't really do an instantaneous rate of change when you're working with a table. Um, instantaneous rates of change are only possible when you're doing maybe sometimes graphs and definitely when you're working with functions. But we're, we're going to estimate what the instantaneous rate of change is by doing the average rate of change. And so, how am I going to estimate what the instantaneous rate of change is at 4? Well, as you guys know, that on a graph, you don't need to draw this for now, okay, just watch. On a graph, the average rate of change is the secant line between two dots. Tangent line is the slope between them. Well, if you pick two dots that are really close to where you want to find the tangent line, the, the instantaneous rate of change, like two dots that are really close to that, your secant line is pretty much parallel to your tangent line at that point, and therefore you're getting a pretty good estimate of what the tangent line would be. So what we're going to be doing is instead of finding the instantaneous rate of change, we're going to find the average rate of change by the two points that are closest to t equals 4, and that would be here. So we're going to do the average rate of change of these points. So h prime of t, I'm sorry, h prime of 4. Now you don't want to put equals because it's not equal to, but it's approximately equal to the average rate of change between t equals 5 and t equals 3. Okay, now we're going to simplify this. h of 5 is 6, h of 3 is 3. 6 minus 3 is 3, 5 minus 3 is 2, and so there it is. The instantaneous rate of change at uh, t equals 4 is approximately 3 over 2. But 3 over 2 what? They want us, once again, to interpret what it means in the context. So what is my input unit? Years. What is the output unit? That's, that might be tricky for you, but let's take a look. H is meters, and that's what we have on the top, is meters. But on the bottom, 5 and 3, those are time values. Those are years. So what we're looking at here is the output units are meters per year. So we have 3 half, or one point, you could say 1.5 if you want, meters per year. Okay, now what does that mean? The instantaneous rate of change of the height of this tree at t equals 4, at year 4, is approximately 1.5 meters per year. So there's your interpretation. So I'll write it out. The rate at which... Hello, Mr. John. Hello. Another late night, huh, brother? Yeah. The rate at which the tree is growing... is well, we'll put at t equals 4 
is 3 over 2 meters per year. And so once again here we have the context, input units, output units. All right, um, so next question. The graph of F is given below and consists of one line segment and a semicircle. Um, so let's go ahead and begin here. So part A says let H be the integral of F from negative 3 to X. Identify the relative max of H and justify your answer. So this is look, harking us back to 6.7 part 1. But to find a relative max, the first thing you have to do is you have to find the derivative of H. The derivative of H is going to be the derivative of that. And we take the derivative of an integral, it just cancels the integral out and you're left with f of x. Now the next thing we have to do is we have to find where does h prime of x equal 0. In other words, where does f of x equal 0? Well, you could tell where the function f of x equals 0 by looking at the graph of f and looking for where it touches the x-axis, which is here and here. So h prime of x, which is f of x, equals 0 at x equals negative 2 and at 2. However, that's not answering the question yet. Okay? The question is asking us, where's the relative max? Now, you have a relative max when your function goes from when h of x goes from an increasing to a decreasing situation, that's when you have a relative max, right? Now, that means the derivative of h, which is f of x, would have to be changing from a positive value, positive slope, to a negative slope. So at which of these places where it touches 0 does f of x change from positive to negative? Well, that would be here. To the left, it's above, and to the right, it's below. So the graph of f is changing from positive to negative at negative 2. Now, over here, nothing is happening at 2. It goes from negative to 0 to negative again. So that point is not a relative min or a max. Okay? And just, in, oh, never mind. I was going to say talk about mins, but we'll do that in the next question. So here's our answer. Since, here's how you have to write it h prime of x, which equals f of x, um, goes from positive to negative at x equals negative 2, h of x has a relative max at that point. Okay. The next one says, identify the relative min of h. Well, we already know this is in it, right? That's the max. Now, you have a relative min whenever your derivative goes from negative to positive. When your graph goes down and then up, right? Which means that the derivative would have to go from negative to positive. Well, h prime of x, which equals f of x, never goes from negative to positive on this graph. It goes from positive to negative, but after that, the graph is always below the x-axis. It never goes from negative to positive. Once it's negative, it stays negative. So our answer to this one will be the following. Since, let me back up a little bit here. Since h prime of x which equals f of x, does not change from negative to positive for any value of x, there is no relative min.
Okay, so that's the answer to part B. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at another one here. Identify where H has a point of inflection and justify your answer. So, points of inflection are places where the second derivative equals zero. Okay? And also where the second derivative changes signs. So, we have H of X, right, is equal to this. This, the slope of h, is my graph over here, f of x. So the second derivative of h is the derivative of my graph over there. So f prime is the slope of f. Okay? So, first of all, let's find where the slope of f is... Um, 0. So the slope of f is 0 at x equals 2. Take a look. Um, at that point, you would have a horizontal tangent line. Now, I want you guys to understand, it's not equal to 0 because it's touching the x-axis. That doesn't matter. What matters is the, the tangent line is a horizontal line, which means that the slope is 0. Okay? So I want you to notice something about the slope of f at this point. The slope of f goes from positive slope to negative slope. So does the slope change at that point? The answer is yes. And so that is a point of inflection. So here's what we're going to say. We're going to say since um, h double prime of x, which equals f prime of x, equals 0, and changes from positive to negative. The slope goes from positive slope to negative slope at x equals 2. The graph of h, well, I guess we should just say h, h of x has a point of inflection at that point. And that's our answer to part C. Okay. Now, technically, we could say that there is another point of inflection. Now, this is something where I've gotten conflicting information from different books, but um, I just did a little bit of research, and I found out they actually do count this other one as a point of inflection. Um, there's another place where there's a point of inflection. Now, I'll give you guys a hint. Look for the place where h double prime, which is h prime, I'm sorry, f prime, changes signs. In other words, where else does the slope of f change signs? We found one here. It goes from positive to negative. Where else does it change signs? Right there. Now, the reason why I was a little bit um, hesitant to talk about that one is because um, I've seen a lot of textbooks where they say that um, the, it, the point of inflection is only a point of inflection if um, the second derivative actually equals zero. Well, at this point, the second derivative is undefined. But we're going to go ahead and say that there's also a point of inflection at zero. So we're going to say since h double prime of x equals f prime of x changes signs at x equals zero, h of x has a point of inflection at that point. Um, like I said, so I've gotten conflicting information on whether it works or not, but um, I actually just came across one FRQ from 2016, number three, if you guys want to look it up, where they actually do count a cusp as a possible point of inflection for a similar type of question as this. So we're going to go ahead and say it, it counts, but um, I'll try not to give you guys something too ambiguous on your actual exam here. But uh, let's go ahead and continue. Part D, identify the absolute min 
and max of h. Justify your answer. So, um, the absolute min and max of h. So how do we do this? Well, to find an absolute extrema, you have to do the candidates test. Endpoints are where we begin. So we're going from negative 3 to 4, and anywhere where the function crosses the x-axis are other candidates. Okay, So there's that, and we want to find what is the max of h at those points. So we have to figure out what h is at each of those values. So what is h of negative 3? h of negative 3 is the integral from negative 3 to, plug in your negative 3 there as well, right? And any time the top limit and bottom limit match, that's just 0. So this is 0. Next, we'll figure out what is h of negative 2. Going from negative 3 to negative 2. You might want to make sure you don't have to reverse your limits. In this case, we don't. You always want to make sure your smaller one's on the bottom, but be careful of that. So we're going from negative 3 to negative 2, and that's an area question. So 1 times 1 divided in half is a half. So that's 1 half. Next question, h of positive 2. So now we have this area. Now we've got to do this area and this area put together. All right, so now we've got a little more thinking to do. First of all, so we know that this is a half here, right? This one's also pretty easy. 2 times 2 is 4, cut in half is 2, and it's negative since it's below the x-axis. But we got one of these little wedges. We know how to do those now, don't we? So if you want to find the area of a wedge, uh, that's drawn terribly. Let me redraw that. If you want to find the area of a wedge, you need to find the area of the square that encompasses that wedge and subtract from it the quarter circle that would leave that wedge and remainder there. So the base and height of that wedge is 2, which means that's the base and height of the square as well, so that's 4. And it's also the radius of your semicircle or your quarter circle. So um, we have 4 minus pi r squared over 4, right? These cancel. And so that wedge has an area of 4 minus pi. Okay? But notice it's below the x axis. So it's actually going to be a negative 4 minus pi. We want to make sure it's a negative 4 minus pi. Okay? So that's going to be our area there. So the area is going to be 1 half minus 2 minus the quantity of 4 minus pi. And we're going to have to simplify this and estimate it a little bit. So um, a half take away 2, well, actually let's go ahead and distribute first. We have 1 half minus 2, and if we distribute we end up with minus 4 plus pi. Combining these we get 1 half minus 6 plus pi. Um, a half take away 6 is negative 5 and a half plus pi. And so I'm just going to leave my answer like that for now, and we'll see if we need to get a little bit more precise in a minute. But for now, that'll be good. But basically, we're adding 3, which is approximately what pi is to this. All right, let's go ahead and do the last one. Now we need to do um, the h of... 4, right? So for this one, we're going from negative 3 to 4. And basically, we're just going to add up all the areas now, right? So we have a half minus 2 minus 4 minus the quantity of 4 minus pi. And this is symmetrical, so this one's actually going to have the same area as the other one. Okay, so now what do we have? We have 1 half minus 2 
I'm going to go ahead and distribute the negatives in now, just so I don't have to do it afterwards. Same thing here. Okay, so we have negative 2, negative 4, negative 4 makes negative 10, plus a half is negative 9.5 plus 2 pi. Okay. So there's our final answers there. Um, let's clean this up a little bit. Now we have to find our absolute min and absolute max. Well, if you add 3 to 5, negative 5 and a half, you're still going to have a negative. And 2 pi is about 6, right? So if you add 6 to 9 and a half, you're still going to have a negative. So one of those have to be our minimum. 0 is meaningless, but we have one positive value, and it's right there. So that's my absolute max. at x equals negative 2. Now, we, all, we might also want to say h of negative 2 equals a half, right? Um, now, what is the uh, minimum going to be? Well, it's one of the last two. So, we just get to do some math here. Negative 5.5 plus 3.14, right? We're just going to have to subtract those from each other a little bit. Uh, I need to line up my decimals better than that. Just a second. There we go. All right, so let's go ahead and do our subtraction here. We have um, 6, 3, 2, and it's negative 2.36. Okay, now for this one, negative 9.5. 2 pi is going to be about 6.28, just double 3.14, right? negative 3.22. So this one is smaller. Okay, so we have an absolute min at x equals um, 4, which is h of 4 equals, I'm just going to write it like this. Okay. So that's how you do it. Now, they say justify your answer. And just so you guys know, when you're talking about absolute mins and maxes, the candidate's test is your justification. So you're good with there. So we can stop. All right. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at part E. Let g of x, so I'm giving you a new function, let g of x equal this, find g prime of 3. So first of all, let's find g prime of x. To find g prime of x, we've got to take the derivative of this and this. So the derivative of x squared is x, and the derivative of this is going to be, I don't think that prime was supposed to be there actually. The derivative uh, of that is going to be f of x. Now they want us to find g prime of 3, so I'm going to go ahead and plug in 3. So we have 3 plus f of 3. And what's f of 3? In other words, what's the, uh, what is the value of this function at 3? I, I just realized I'm supposed to be doing negative 3, you guys. So replace those with a negative 3. So what is the value of f at negative 3? Um, so that would be here, and that's 1. And so the final answer would be negative 2. All right. So there you guys have it. There's your FRQs. Hopefully that'll help you guys with your exam on Thursday. See you then.